I have both a research and an extension appointment, and so I think that what we're talking about these, these, these two days is important in both of those. Um, obviously, there's some, some regulations that are involved, and we'll talk a little bit about that, but what I want to focus on today is kind of the extension side. Um, I've really only been flying uh, drones for personal enjoyment, I should say, since uh, last fall, really, so less than a year. But um, we put together several of these conversations with farmers in Missouri, and they've been really very well accepted and, and attended, and, and it just shows not only the number of people at this meeting, but in other kinds of venues, how, uh, how much interest there is in this, in, this, um, in this arena. And so I'm happy to be here. I I'm going to talk a little bit about what I would talk to my Missouri farmers about, but it, it surely would cross, those, uh, cross the river and have some uh, application to the people that are here in the room. So the title was related to uh, tomorrow's agriculture. And so we're going to try to take a little peek over the horizon. Um, my eyesight's not very good. I, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to see very far over that horizon. And in fact, the next slide is, is this crystal ball, and I don't have a very good crystal ball at all. I found that it's good, though, to talk about the future because by the time it gets here, I'm not going to be in the same room as you, and, and you probably won't... Uh, won't hold me accountable to that. And in fact, when we, when, we, when we really get down to that part of the conversation, I'm really going to talk about two levels. What I think is the initial level that farmers are going to be using and, and, and very much like what the farmer panel talked about. And then we'll talk about some of these other sensors and, and some of the roles and some, uh, that those sensors will have. And then Talking about this crystal ball, I found this uh, statement from, from, uh, from uh, Wilbur Wright. And uh, he had made a prediction that, that, that people wouldn't farm, or I'm sorry, wouldn't fly for 50 years. Well, he was obviously incorrect, and he was part of that, that, uh, that conversation and that technology. And so again, I'm just setting you up so that you understand that I may be wrong in terms of what we talk about uh, today. So when I have this conversation with farmers, I have at least these four issues, and I know a couple of these have been kind of beat around quite a bit, and so we won't have uh, too much of additional conversation about it. But I think it's important that not only do we talk about what this technology can do, uh, how you can use it, but we, we, we as, as farmers need to kind of think broader than that and think about what are the implications, what are the rules, what are the privacy issues. And so that's why we talk about all four of these uh, with our farmers. So let's talk about, and again, I'm going to run through this really quickly because you've already talked about it. And, and we all know that the federal agency that's involved in the safety aspects is the FAA, and so I'm not going to go into too much more detail. This is an image that talks about the various um, airspaces, and, and, and basically, um, and I'm not sure exactly if, if the person in front of me um, um, would, would use this 700-foot um, um, boundary. But that's basically the boundary of, of, of whether the air is, is, is navigational or not. And, and again, there's some other kinds of uh, air spaces as you get close to those kind of weird little, little uh, drawings in this uh, slide, in this image, is as you get closer to an airport, it depends on the size of that airport, um, there's, there's greater restrictions, at least in terms of the FAA mine. But we, we won't really talk very much about this because we've done it. But I did go to their website, and I'm not really here to defend the federal agency, but, but if you, I underline the, the number of times that they use the word safety or some derivation of that. And so that really is their, um, I'm going to put the best construction on that, that really is their issue, and it's, it's one that we, also, I think our concern about is making sure that we do these things um, in, in a safe way. 
And then finally, and not to bring up another sore point, but um, when we talked, when Roundup Ready Soybeans came out, my extension program that year, the next couple years, was very much devoted to how to use that technology, but also what are the rules, what are the, the new rules that farmers were going to have to follow to be able to use that technology. And, and I think when it comes down to it, um, I think these two issues are important. If you want to use the technology, we need to understand the rules and follow the rules. And if we want that technology to be available to us in the future, we need to understand the rules and follow rules. Now, do we understand what those rules are? Maybe not in terms of, of, of drones, but uh, I think that's just kind of the, the way I look at it, and, um, and, and we need to keep those in mind. So, and again, I, we don't, I don't want to spend too much time on these slides, but it's hard to understand exactly what those regulations are. I, I found a news clip, a TV station in Oklahoma. They had reached out to um, FAA, and this is what they had put on their news broadcast. And basically, it was what I think we had talked about a couple times, that farmers could do pretty much what they wanted. Now, we've had other regulations, and, and, and in that statement, they referred to that circular, which was already talked about a couple times, and here's, and here's a little bit in terms of what I've gleaned out of that circular. And, and it, was down in, it was written in 1981, and you, can, and you can read that if you want. But now, as we moved into this conversation, so when I had conversations with farmers during the extension winter meetings, that's what I was basing my conversation about. Now we have something new. That reinterpretation came out in the last uh, few days uh, of June, and it was mentioned here. The only thing that I think is interesting is that conversation about personal enjoyment. So from now on, whenever you see any images that I'm going to show you today, and any videos that I show you today, they were all taken for personal enjoyment, okay? All right, so one other point. Let's talk a little bit about privacy. And, and I'm gonna show you a video, whoop, I need video one up. <laughs> That's all right. I, I'm gonna show you a video. This is uh, of, um, again, a personal enjoyment effort that I had at our, one of our university farms and it will give you kind of a sense of the line of sight. And this is one of those phantoms that was talked about. This is a, this would be a phantom too. In fact, I brought it here if you want to see what it looks like. But it kind of gives you some sense. And, 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 and the reason I show it here under privacy is that horizon is probably over a mile away. Now, you not necessarily can see what's going on, um, but you can, in fact, see beyond your fence rows, I guess is what I'm saying, okay? So this kind of gives you a sense. We'll just let this spin for a little bit. I'm up probably only about 150 feet, um, but you kind of get a sense, and there's two things that you're probably seeing here. Um, one of those is, is how far you can see. The other one is there's a little fisheye effect, and so many of the cameras that you get, GoPro is one of those, uh, this happens to be the integrated uh, camera that comes with the Phantom 2, one of the Phantom 2s. Uh, they have a fisheye effect. And of course, they do that so you can see greater area. Well, it's, to me, it bugs me. And, and it's not very useful in agriculture, I don't think. And so when I bought a GoPro for one of my other drones, I got a lens that was, that was corrected so it has a flat image. The other thing is if you know about Photoshop, there's actually lens correction filters um, in Photoshop, and, and you can actually put a video in that, and it will straighten it out, and it's uh, pretty amazing, uh, amazing technology. But anyhow, you get a sense. This is our research farm. You can see the plots. This, I think, was in November, um, so most of the things are, have been um, harvested, but you kind of get a sense, even though this is not the world's best uh, venue for seeing some of these images, you, you get a sense of at least um, 
what one can see from one of these and then also um, how far one can see. We'll just let it spin out and just, just be a little bit longer and then we'll find a landing spot. I should say that I have crashed this one before, but only once, and I was able to repair it on my own. Um, so um, they, do, uh, they do take a little practice. While we're coming down to the landing point, I would just say that the, one of the reasons that I like this particular um, unmanned aer aerial uh, vehicle is because when I let go of the joysticks, it hovers. Now, it seems like such a simple thing, but that avoids probably 95% of the crashes. And uh, so, anyhow, so we're coming down landing, and you can, you can cut it off. Thanks for that. All right. So just one more point about privacy. And I think this is the issue that, that we really need to, to keep in mind. And, and again, that um, what people do, uh, where they are, the people, they're, they're highly visible. This just happens to be a picture of, of myself and my group as we're, as we're flying one of these things. And, and, and just kind of a word to the wise. Um, there are some protections, legal protections for privacy, and, and I'm afraid we're going to have additional laws, just as the lawyer had talked about, and so we have to be very, very cautious. All right, enough of that stuff. Let's talk about what we can do with these things. And I know you're going to see a lot of this, and you've seen from not only presenters, but, um, but um, some of the, the vendors here. I just want to tell you what my take is. And, and, and this is really going to be, not necessarily now and future, but kind of steps in terms of what one can do with these vehicles. So the first one is something that's pretty simple, I suppose, but shouldn't be overlooked. Some of you have heard of Kip Colors, right? The world soybean record holder. Um, I've been to a number of his presentations, and almost every time he said, you ought to know your fields, and that's, I can't argue with that. And I've been around my state talking about scouting fields and trying to understand what's going on in that field. I say that, but I know it's difficult. Once corn gets uh, waist high, or even soybeans, once they're knee high, or if they're in nor narrow rows, they're hard to walk through. And so it's very difficult. What this one piece of equipment does is allows us to look at our fields without worrying about where the roads are, where the fences are, how tall the crop is, where the ditches are. It gives you that unique perspective. You know, we've all been on an airplane, we've all looked down and go, wow, what, what amazing view you can have in terms of, you can see the soil patterns, you can see various um, ways in which the crops are going growing, that is a unique perspective. All right. So, the other important part of this is that you don't, you're under control, you own it, you can put it out when you want to. I know a lot of people have talked about this already. Um, you're not affected by clouds, and I'll, and I'll talk about some of the other remote sensing that I've done because those can be uh, problems. And then finally, the sensor that we're going to start with uses visible light, and people have talked about that. It's both images, both photos, and video. Um, in fact, when I fly, I, that's how I set it up. It's taken a, a, a image every, I think every five seconds taking an image every five seconds as it's taking the video. The, the, the uh, phantom that I have up here is um, you can take both images and, and uh, video, but you're actually looking at it from the cell phone and, and hitting, a, hitting a shutter uh, to do that. Okay. The human eye is an amazing remote sensor, and we ought not to underestimate that. And, and, and I, 
you know, I work at a university and I've been in a lot of meetings and I just amazed the, the, how we get all hung up in what the excellent would be and forget about the good. And, and that's why I don't want any of us to put that aside. It's pretty good to be able to just to look at visible light images. You can tell a lot, and I'm going to show you a couple pictures here in just a little bit. So don't worry too much yet about all the kind of complicated uh, images and processing that, that, has, uh, that can be done, because being able to see visible light is pretty amazing. Now I've given these talks, similar talks, around the state, and, and the other thing that I learned, in fact we've worked in, in, in Precision Ag, and, and, I, and I've learned that in that process too. Faculty think that they, faculty members like me, think we know everything and we think we know how these things are going to be used and we go out and we give a talk and he says, well, you're going to use it in this, 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 this way. What I learned, not only in my precision ag work, but even just with the drone uh, talks that we had uh, this, um, this winter, Every time I show that video, I show that very one that I just showed you, everybody, there's probably eight different, 10 different, 12 different ways in which somebody out in the audience thinks that that can be used that I never thought of. And so being able to kind of think through that, um, um, you know, some of you probably grow livestock. I'm a, I'm a corn soybean person. And I showed in the southwest Missouri where you have to drive a long ways to see a soybean field but there's cattle everywhere. And they say, oh man, I can use that to count my cows. I can use that to check my uh, fences. Um, down in southeast, which doesn't have any animals, but lots of irrigation, they use polypipe. I can run, I can walk my polypipe in just a few seconds as I, a, a, from the air. I can tell whether it's working properly. So anyhow, lots and lots of different ways. And so visible light images, pretty amazing. So here's, so let me just show you a couple images. And again, um, this is from uh, on the research farm at University of Missouri. This happens to be a, a cornfield and the person that is doing this work is testing seed treatments. And so there's lots of different plots out there and they have diff each plot is a different type of seed treatment. And so I just, for my personal enjoyment, I just flew over that uh, plot and you can clearly see um, uh, stand differences. Now, it's not enough to be able to count the data, uh, have stand counts, but you can see where there's weak places and where there's uh, areas that um, are growing fine. And this related, in this case, happens to be related to a seed treatment, but it could be related to other kinds of things that happen in your fields. This is uh, a soybean uh, plots from the same person who's doing the same kind of work uh, in soybean. And it's not as quite as easy, it's not as dramatic, um, uh, because soybean is actually, even by this stage, is kind of compensated for some of those yield or stand differences. But it, again, it kind of gives you a sense. And I'm not very high, I'm probably only um, maybe 100 feet up. So I'm not seeing a lot of distance, but I can see my crops pretty well. And then finally, this is uh, one of our uh, studies where we're looking at rotation. These plots are 40 feet long and 30 feet wide. And we have different rotations. We have got continuous corn, I've got continuous soybean, I've got corn soybean rotation. I've got two years of corn, one year of soybean, two years of soybean, one years of corn, all of those kinds of things. And it's, but I just brought this slide in to kind of give you a sense of what those crops look like. Again, I'm probably only up 125, 150 feet, so it kind of gives you some sense. All right, and I wouldn't get too excited about how the, the it looks like the, the beans on uh, the one side are a little bit darker than on the other. I just think that happens to be a light um, angle kind of a, a difference, all right? But anyhow, it gives you some sense of what visible light can do. Okay, before, we get, before I get to that is, I just want to make, I just want to drive that point home and I don't want to push that too hard, but visible light images can do you a lot. And so uh, I know there's been some questions about should we wait until the technology is perfect and I say no. 
today's technology can show you a lot and you can use it a lot and I think that you will find that it's very useful uh, to you. All right, so let's show video two. So this is going to be pretty hard to see and again it's with this phantom and you can really see the fisheye effect in here but um, I'm going to ask you to Yeah, pause it right there, can you? All right. So I, it's really hard to see under these light conditions. But this is a project where we've got no tillage and conventional tillage. I've got um, co uh, soybean rotated with, with corn, and I've got continuous soybean. And, and this has been in those plots now for 23 years. Now you might ask, why am I looking at continuous soybean? Well, I hate to tell you this, I suppose, admit it, but 30-some percent of the acres of soybean in Missouri is planted after soybean. So we have a lot of continuous soybean uh, acreage, and so we've been collecting data now for 20-some years. What you can't see very well here is a plot that is continuous soybean, no-till. What you can't really see growing there, but you can see if you really look under better light conditions, is I have developed Roundup resistant mare's tail. And so most of the plants, unfortunately, that you can kind of see maybe here is that. Because, you know, I'm trying to study the, um, trying to study the cropping system I got to do the cropping system, but I had the same problems that somebody would have if they were doing that cropping system. And, and so it's, I got, uh, I'm not very well loved on the farm because I have those uh, glyphosate resistant uh, mare's tail. But it shows that if I'm driving, if I'm uh, flying over that field, those things show up perfectly. And as other people have talked, I can come down, I can hover right ab ab above it, I can get a good look. Um, this particular uh, drone that I would be using for this particular uh, picture has an image on my cell phone. So I'm flying it from my, I'm not flying it from my cell phone, I'm watching the image on my cell phone. And then I can take a picture when I want, I can take a video when I want, and so again, visible light is, uh, is pretty useful. All right. Yeah, we can, we can, yeah, we, you can get rid of it. Huh? Go back to the slides, yeah. All right. Well, I'm always glad when that technology works. Hats off to my assistant. All right. So I think some people have talked about this, but this is an important point. And, and whenever I talk about uh, remote sensing, we put a name on that. It's called directed scouting. Almost never will you be able to look at something and know what the problem is. But you can take an 80 acre field and you can say, I need to go look at 5, 10, whatever percentage of that. And so that directed scouting where you come back and I know several people today have used that term ground truthing, that's an extremely part of this whole system. And so it really blends in well with trying to get out there and do the scouting of the field, but instead of taking the time it takes to scout 80 acres, I can go and do some intensive either observation, and I'm sorry I keep fading in and out. My head bobbles too much, I'm sorry. But I can, I can direct my observation and my time to the parts of the field that really need it, and that's what precision agriculture is all about, right? where you can put your effort where it really needs to be done. All right. So let's take a look a little bit at some of those other um, sensors that have been discussed. And everybody's going to have a different viewpoint, and you're just going to get mine, OK? Now, what's the, I put the sky's the limit. You know, it's really pretty bad, isn't it, to use sky in this? Uh, nah, well, anyhow, let's get that off, the, off there, OK. So here's a couple of things that have been talked about. And I just want to tell you what you can and can't do with these. This is my perspective. Multispectral means that you're going to be collecting data on several different 
wave bands, okay? Light uh, comes in, and we saw a picture of, of the uh, spectrum. So blue light is a certain wavelength, red light, near infrared, far infrared, ultraviolet. Those are different kinds of wavelengths. And multispectral means more than two, basically, okay? And usually there's some filters in there that kind of narrow that. So um, when someone talks about using um, um, on-the-go nitrogen fertilizer uh, application um, uh, by the greenness of the, of the, of the, um, of the corn, Sometimes they're looking at the green wavelength. Now, they may be looking at some other ones, but they're looking at a narrow wavelength, okay? Multispectral means that we're looking at a couple of them, maybe five of them. And so when you calculate what was been talked about over and over again, I'll show you some images here in a little bit of NDVI, you need at least two wavelengths, okay? That's multispectral. The one below that is hyper, hyperspectral. I know the first speaker today talked about it and thought that was pretty cool. It's pretty complicated. It's hundreds of wavelengths. Now some of you may grow hay, right, and you take it in and have a hay quality. I don't know if you've ever seen that kind of a little instrument that will measure the protein and uh, some of the other, the digestibility. That's a hyperspectral, uh, um, yeah, not image, but uh, reading of that hay quality because the protein has a certain fingerprint. It's hard, it's hard for me to understand exactly how many of us in this room will, will need that kind of thing. If I had a sprayer that I'm trying to differentiate between water hemp and soybean, I need hyperspectral, okay? Because there's a little bit of a different reflection from a water hemp leaf than there is from a soybean leaf. Okay, those are, that's the kind of thing that it can do. Very seldom will we in this room need that, okay? But it's a possibility, and it takes some processing. And so much of what we're talking about here is not necessarily what a farmer's going to be using on their own, but will get some uh, assistance from an input dealer. Infrared, we've already talked, some people have already talked about that. Infrared, when we use that term infrared, we don't mean you know, you can have the utility company come out and look at your house and see where, the, where you have uh, leakage of, uh, of hot air or cold air, right? That's not usually what we're talking about. When we use the term infrared, we're talking about near-infrared. And what near-infrared is, is just wavelengths longer than red light. We can't see it with our eye, but it tells uh, us something about the amount of leaf area. And we'll talk more about that here in just a little bit. Temperature, thermal bands, I'll show you a picture of that. Uh, LIDAR is like radar, but it uses laser. And this is useful for plant height. And it doesn't mean so much maybe for us in corn and soybeans, but people that have forages and want to know uh, what the carrying capacity of their, of their paddocks are, LID LIDAR is pretty cool. Okay, so let's just go through a couple of these. Oh, the sensors that I'm talking about, they, they, you know, we've talked about them here uh, today. They surely exist. And, um, and maybe those sensors have to be kind of shrunk a little bit. Maybe they have to come down in price before they really are, are used widespread. But I don't want anybody to say that I'm saying that this is going to be in the future only because these, these sensors already exist. And I'm going to show you uh, some images that I have from at least several of these uh, sensors. Okay, and, and as I said, this is where the processing is going to come in. With visible light, your brain is the processor. Almost every case with visible light, your brain's the processor. Now, we use visible light. We can actually take a picture of a soybean field. We've got software, and we put a little um, limits on the greenness, the green wavelengths, and it goes in there and it says how much of that picture is leaf material and how much isn't. So I can actually use a visible image and, and get the same kind of number that people have talked about here on NDVI. How much, and basically all it is, what's the leaf area out there in, in both cases? All right. So 
Now, this is unfortunate because you won't be able to see these very well. But this is a satellite image. This is called false color infrared. So it's near infrared, but we've changed it so that we can see it. We can't see infrared. So we've changed it and you know, it's an interesting that I work in this area because I'm colorblind, but I think those are red, <laughs> right? And the deeper red that is there means more leaf area, okay? And I just want, and I know you can't see this very well, but if you could, you could see a couple of kind of dark images there. Those, this is a soybean field. That's where we had an outbreak of SDS and it defoliated. And so the leaves are gone. And so no longer are they, um, uh, on this image, uh, red, they're dark because, because the leaf area has disappeared. And I wanted to show you this one, and I don't know if you can see, can anybody see that little dot that's there? Yeah, good, okay. Can anybody, I put a question mark here because I know what it is, but can anybody guess what that little dot is? And then actually there's three of them uh, in that field. What? I tell you, let me just, I'll give you a big hint. This picture was taken after a thunderstorm. Lightning strikes. You know, we looked at the image and we go, what the heck is that? <laughs> That's probably about a 20 acre. Now this is a satellite picture up over 250 miles up in the air, okay? That's probably about 20 feet. We looked at it, I got my, uh, not me, I got my grad student out with a little backpack with a GPS and, and so we knew this is all coordinated. And, and they went out there and sure enough, there's these patches of dead soybean and it was lightning strikes. And there's actually two or three of them in this image. I thought that's pretty cool, pretty cool. Now, this is a soybean, um, I'm sorry. This happens to be corn, it's in that same field. And, and, and now this is, just, uh, this is just visible light, given a satellite picture. But you see some areas where it looks like there's corn plants that are missing maybe, perhaps, okay? And, and what happened there is we had an application for black cutworm and, um, and some of the um, areas on the sprayer were clogged up. And so some of the rows did not get the application. Cutworms came in there and cut off our plants. And so again, it's a way in which uh, just an example of how even just visible light, you can figure out that something's wrong and then you go out to that field and you can see uh, what's happening. All right, so this is another field, uh, a research field. Uh, vis this is visible light and infrared light. And, and again, it just kind of shows you that there's pretty good relationship and, and the infrared light gives you a little bit more capability of making some calculations, but you can see a lot from, from the visible light as well. This is an interesting field in that if we come from that side of the slide, it's very flat, and then it comes down to a pretty steep slope, and then where that what looks like lines are, that's a waterway, and then it comes back up. And some of the real bright areas there, those are, those are um, terraces, okay? Those are terraces. Now what happened in this field is that we planted it and we got heavy rain. And so where it was really flat, so way over toward that side of the screen, it was the water ponded and we had low stands, okay? And so you kind of get that kind of a look and that's exactly what you can see. And when you look at that, both the visible light and the infrared light, you can see where there's poor stands. Now, unbeknownst to me, one of our technicians noticed that there was poor stands. And what happens in a soybean field when you have poor stands? A lot of weeds come into it, right? And so he went out and he sprayed uh, up and down on this, on this slide some herbicide. I'll have to admit to you that it was off-label herbicide application. So we have another image. Now this is from, a, th these images are taken from a, um, an airplane based uh, uh, sensors. Now I know you can't hardly see it, but you can see way that probably that last tenth or so of the plot, you can see a, 
a difference in coloration. That herbicide shortened those plants there. And it shows up even on the yield, even on the yield monitor, uh, we can see that. Uh, and so again, it shows you what happens when you do something not quite right. <laughs> but it shows you the power of these images. All right. Here's another one. I like this. This is NDVI, right? All that, all that NDVI does is it tells you how much leaf area is there. Shorter plants, less leaf area, gives you a sense. This is a field. Uh, I believe this is a satellite picture. This is a non-Roundup Ready soybean. And what happened there is that when they sprayed the herbicide, where the sprayer overlapped, it shortened the plants. And that's what those stripes are through the field. Okay, and so you can see that very clearly. You probably may not be able to see it with the naked eye, but you can see it when I calculated the NDVI. The other thing that you see on there is those kind of up and down uh, patterns. We have looked at old photographs. Those are old dead furrows, probably at least 10 years before this picture was taken. And, and they were plowed up and down in that particular case. And we think that water has captured there. And in this particular case, it, it drowned out some of those plants. Now, that's a little bit too much CSI to really know that's what's happening. But that's what we think uh, was happening in that field. OK. And then here's, I want to show you these. And I hope you can see this. This, this is thermal imaging. This is a handheld, not from a, but I wanted to show you the power of this, okay? So if you look at right in the middle of each of those images, <clears throat> that's the between the row, where, where it's really the soil, in that particular case, is warmer than the plants, right? So the plants are cooler. Now, I happen to be a no-tiller, so I picked out pictures that showed that no-till was cooler uh, than, the, than the till. So no-till is on this side of the screen, and, um, and tilled is over on that side. And, and, and that number at the top, that's centigrade, but that's the average temperature. But I could go in there, and I could pick a single leaf, and I could tell you what the temperature of that is. That's the power of thermal. And, and I, I see it really going to be helpful when we're trying to get an early warning in terms of a, of a disease problem, um, particularly diseases. We're using it in our no-till versus conventional till? Is there root uh, growth patterns? Does that relate to how much water can be extracted from, from, those, uh, from those soils? And I think uh, that's just about it. So final thoughts. There's information in those fields, and we ought to be the ones that are collecting it. We ought to have control over that, and that's what these drones are able to do for us. Other, other forms are possible, and we're going to see much more of that and probably a combination. Somebody talked about these kind of uh, flocks of uh, little satellites. They're surely out there. It's going to be very useful. But I think having the personal um, drone is going to be important for the future. So in your own hands. And I think we'll just stop it as that. We're, I'm done. And uh, we have maybe one question, maybe? Yeah, so the question is, how do you know you're at whatever height? On the one drone I have, I don't know. On the second one, on the cell phone, it tells me what the height is. And so I know exactly when I'm at 399.9. Yeah. But I'm always, I'm never any higher than that. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Thank you.